Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is me again, Dr. Sharif al -Gaman. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, chapter 14, uh, lecture number two, or part two about trust analysis using the stiffness method. In the previous lecture, we talked about fundamentals of the stiffness method. Also, we developed together the member local stiffness matrix, which we call the K dash in the local coordinates of the member. Then we use displacement and force transformation matrices to change this one from K dash to K small without dash, which means the member global stiffness matrix. Then after we develop the member global stiffness matrix for each member, we can combine them to develop the truss stiffness matrix, which we call it K capital. Then we solve it example 14.1 to explain how to develop the structure stiffness matrix. In this lecture, we are going to talk about application of the stiffness method for trust analysis. How to apply or to use this structure stiffness matrix to determine unknown displacements, to determine uh, unknown forces, including external reactions and internal forces in trust members. To do this, we are going to Take example 14.3. To apply the uh, stiffness method for cross analysis, we are going to start by the first equation, which is U equals A times displacement. U equals K times displacement, where Q is the forces and the global coordinates. K is the structural stiffness matrix. D is the displacement at the low, and of course, in the global coordinates at different degrees of freedom. So this equation, it will be written in a form of matrices as you can see here. The first matrix is the force matrix. It will include number of forces. The number of forces equals to the number of degrees of freedom we have. Like for example, uh, in this, uh, example or in this truss here that we solved it in uh, example 14.1, we can see that here we have six degrees of freedom because we have three nodes, one, two, three. At each node, we have two degrees of freedom. So the total number will be six, one, two, three, four, and five, six. So you will expect that you will have a matrix, force matrix from Q1 to Q6. And the same also displacement matrices, matrix, it will be D1, until D6, okay? For the structural stiffness matrix, it will be six by six matrix. Always we start for the displacement, we start numbering, the lower numbers goes for unknown displacements. For, for example, in this uh, figure here, we can see at node number two, we have uh, degree of freedom number one, degree of freedom number two. We can see that these two degrees of freedom, there are some displacements, but we don't know how much is this displacement, so we call them unknown displacements, or DU, D unknown. If you have two unknown displacements, you will have the other side for the forces, two known forces. So the number of known forces equal the number of unknown displacements. If you have D1 and D2, they are unknown, so you'll expect that you will have Q1 and Q2 will be known. Known, it means they will be external loads in the problem itself. Uh, it could be any value, it could be zeros based on the problem itself. How much loads do we have at this node? Okay. Then for other displacements, they will be all known displacements, D known, because from D3 until D6, if you can see here in this example, D3, D4, D5, D6, all of them are at the supports, at pin support. So no displacement at three or four or five and six. So I know them. I know that they will be zeros in this case. Okay. On the other hand, the U3 to Q6 will be unknown forces. We call them Q unknown because they will be external reactions. It means we don't know them. We need to find them later. Okay. Why? Because if you can see here, three, three, four, five, six, they are reactions. I don't know them. So in this equation here, on this, these matrices here, 
The first step is to find D1 and D2, unknown displacements. Once I found D1 and D2, I will be able to find the Q3, Q4, Q5, and Q6. To make this easier, we are going to subdivide the matrix. Like after the unknown displacement, we are going to subdivide the matrix in the horizontal direction, and the same also in the vertical direction. So to solve for D1 and D2, we are going to take this first part, okay? This part we'll call it K11, then this will be K12, K21, and K22. Let's see it again, it will be in this form. You will have the force displacement part. The first part will be known, the second part will be unknown. On the opposite, the displacement matrix, the first part it will be D unknown, the second part will be D known. Of course, this will be the stiffness matrix that you already developed earlier in 14.1, or in any other problem, we have to start by developing the stiffness matrix. Then let's solve this one. So to get the Q known, Q known equals what? K11 times du plus K12 times dk. Okay, this will give us the first equation here. Again, we can repeat the same thing for the bottom part of the matrix. Q unknown will be K21 times du, which will give us this term, plus kt22 times d known, k22 times d known. Let's take one by one. First, to determine the unknown displacements. As I told you, we have to start finding first the unknown displacements. To find the unknown displacement, we are going to use the first equation, which is the first part, the top part of the matrices here. So q known equals k11 times d u, the unknown, plus k12 times d known. This is the first part here. d known here, dk, will be zero. Usually it will be zero so, since the supports are not displaced. So if you remove this first part here, this equation, it will be reduced to the following form. q known equals k11 times du. Now we need to find du, just we can take this one to the other side, it will be the inverse of the matrix, and will give us this equation, d unknown, the unknown displacement that we need to find equals k11, which is the first part here, the inverse of that one, times q known. q known, it means I know them, k11, I have it, so I can get the unknown displacement, and this will be equation 14.1. Positive, like if you have a positive value of D unknown, it means the direction of the degree of freedom will be similar to the positive direction that you assumed at the beginning, which means right or up. If you have a displacement with a negative value, it means the direction will be opposite to the direction of the degrees of freedom. Always the degree of freedom goes to right and up. This is what we assume at the beginning. So if it is negative, it means it will be opposite. If you have a displacement in the x direction and it is negative, negative, it means it goes to the left. If you are talking about negative displacement, but in the y direction, it means it will be opposite and will be going to down. This will let you know how to know the direction of the displacement. The second point, once we get this unknown displacement, we need to find the unknown external reactions. To determine unknown external reactions, we are going to use the second part, of the second equation, which is the bottom part of this matrix here. So it will be Q unknown equals K21 times DU plus K22 times DK. And again, similar to what we did earlier, uh, D unknown, D known here, this part is usually zero because these are the, the supports. So we can remove this part we have only the first part of the equation, which would be the Q unknown, unknown external reactions equals K21, this part of the stiffness matrix, times the unknown, which we already got on the first step. From this one, it will be easy. You don't need to get the inverse of a matrix because you need to find the Q unknown. So just to multiply K21 by DU and you will get your answer. Again, if you have a positive value of the reaction, it means it will be going to the right or up. 
if you have a negative value of this action, it means the opposite to the direction of the degree of freedom. It means going to the left or going to down based on which degree of freedom you are talking about, vertical or horizontal one. Okay, the last step is to determine the forces in the members. We got the unknown displacements. We got the second one, it was the external reactions. Now the last thing in a trust problem, you need to find the forces in the member, internal forces in the member. In this case, we have to use equation 14.13 that we used to develop earlier in the previous lecture. The Q small, which is the forces in the local coordinates because I need the forces in the member, so it should be in the local coordinates, equals K small dash, which is the stiffness matrix of the member in the local coordinates, times transformation matrix, times displacements in the global coordinates. This is equation 14.13. You can see it like that. Q N and Q F, the force in the near end, the force in the far end, which are, they are exactly the same, but one is opposite to each other, equals A E over L times one minus one minus one one. This part here is the K small dash. Then we have the T capital, the displacement transformation matrix. Then we have D capital, which are the degrees of freedom at the near end, X, Y. Then you have the two at the far end, D, F, X, and then D, F, Y. All of these values, you already got them in the first step when we got the unknown displacements. So which force I get? I will get the Q, N, or Q, F. No, it will be better to get the force at the QF at the far end. Why we need to get the force in the far end? Because the force in the far end, the assumptions that we have, it is pulling from the joint. It's going to the right direction of the x-axis. So because it is pulling from the joint, if you have a positive value, it means it will be a tension force. If you have a negative value, it means it will be a compression force. So positive means tension, negative means compression if you get it from the QF. So how to get it from the QF? We are going to solve for this one and get the QF multiplying these matrices together. At the end, we'll have this equation. This equation QF equals AE over L times minus lambda X minus lambda Y, lambda X lambda Y times displacements in the X and Y at the near end, then displacement uh, at X and Y at the far end. These are displacements. This equation, you don't need to memorize it because it will be given to you. Similar to the member stiffness matrix in the global coordinates, this also this one will be given to you. So just you need to know how to use it, how to use the values of dnx, dny, dfx, dfy, which is referring to this is dnx, dfy, dfx, d, uh, no, this one is dnx, this dny, then at the far end, this will be dfx and this will be dfy. Of course, this depends on which one is near, which one is far. It's not always that the left one will be near and the right one will be far. You can assume it as you want based on your assumption at the beginning. So lambda x, lambda y, I'm not here, the values of lambda x and lambda y, we get it for each member. Okay, this is, you will find that you have this at the beginning when you get the uh, member stiffness matrix. To do that, you have to calculate lambda x and lambda y, which is cosine theta x, cosine theta y. So you go back and you get it from there for each member. Once you did that, you multiply the equation here, you will get the force in the member. Again, if you have a positive value, it means a tension force in the member. If you have a negative value, it means a tension force in the member. Okay, this was the theory. Let's uh, apply this again by solving an example together, which will make things very clear. Okay, this example, 14.3, it asks us to determine the force in each member of the truss shown. And AE is constant. You can see here, this truss is exactly similar to the truss that we solved in uh, example 14.1. But at that time, in 14.1, it was only required to find the stiffness matrix, the structure stiffness matrix. So the structure stiffness matrix is not depending on the forces, it depends on the geometry and lens and where is the position of nodes and so on. So it is the same problem, but here they added a load, which is two kilonewton at node number two going downward, okay? So to solve any problem like that, 
the solution should start by the main equations that we have it here, U capital equals K capitals times D capital. The K is the stiffness matrix, structural stiffness matrix. You already developed this one in example 14.1, or if you are solving a problem from the beginning, you have to start by calculating the K capital. K by making K small for each member, developing like making all of them, assembling all of them together to get the K capital. So the K capital here in this problem, we are going to use the one that we got from example 14.1. So we need to find the Q capital. We need to find the D capital. Let's see to, together how to get them. Q capital, again, it will be Q1 until Q6, because in this problem, we have six degrees of freedom. So it will be with the maximum number that we have it here. And the same for the displacement, you will have from D1 until D6. Now you need to see which one is a known displacement, which one is known displacement, and the same for the forces. Okay. Let's see this. Let's start by the displacements. The displacements, we have to start by one, two, three, four, five, six. So one and two, D1 and D2 here in this problem, this point here, this node number two is free. It can move down and it can move up, left, right, okay, based on the force that we have here. So when you have more force, it will go more down, okay. So for D1 and D2, they are unknown. I don't know the values of D1 and D2. I will need to find them. So I will start in writing D1 and D2. And because they are unknown, I will keep them D1 and D2. Then for D3, Displacement at three. Do we have a displacement at three? You will tell me no, because this is a pin support. So no displacement at three, no displacement at four, and the same for five and six. So I know that D3 until D6, there will be zero displacement. So I can put the values here, zero, D3, four, five, six, they all are zero. Again, now, once you finish this one, you can move to the force matrix. The force matrix, as I told you, if you have unknown displacements D1 and D2, you will expect that you will have Q1 and Q2 with, will be known. So let's see here together. How much is the Q1? Q1, it means the external force in the one direction here or, or at the degree of freedom number one. Do we have any external force here at degree of freedom number one? You will tell me no. Because at this point, I don't have any X force here, no horizontal force here. So the first value here will be zero. How about the second one, the force at the same, the direction of degree of freedom number two? Yes, we'll find that we have a force of two kilonewton, but it is opposite to two. So the Q2 will be minus two because it's opposite to the two directions. So from here, you can see that Q1 will be zero, no force at one, and Q2 here will be minus two because it's opposite to the two direction. So Q1 and Q2 is not referring to node number one, node number two, no, it is referring to the degree of freedom number one, degree of freedom number two. Then starting from Q3, Q4, Q5, and Q6, they are unknown because they are external reactions and we need to find them. So we are going to write them as Q3, Q4, Q5, Q6. So again, here D1 and D2, Unknown, you will find the Q1 and Q2 will be known. D3 to D6 will be known. You will find on the opposite, Q3 until Q6 will be unknown. So what will be the next step? The next step is we need to find D1 and D2. And to do that, we are going to subdivide the matrix. Okay. This is showing the matrix after, after we divide it. And this is the K capital that we got from example 14.1. So no need in this case to recalculate this one because we use the one that we developed earlier in example 14.1. Now we subdivided the matrix as you can see here. Then to find the unknown displacement, you are going to use the first part of the matrix. Okay, let's see here. We'll use the first part of the matrix. So it will be zero minus two equals AE times the first part times D1 plus D2 plus zero. Let's go again to see this one. We'll say zero minus two equals AE times this part multiplied by D1 and D2 plus this part, which is K 
one, two multiplied by zero, so it will be zero at the end. So this will result in this matrix here. So we can rearrange this matrix, or we can uh, so solve this matrix. Because it's very easy to to two equations to uh, unknowns. We'll say zero equals a e times 0.405 d1 plus 0.096 times d2, and this will be equation number one. We are going to repeat this again in equation number two. Minus two equals a e times uh, two in brackets 0.096 d1 plus 0.128 d2. Okay, so you have two equations, two unknowns. In this case, we don't need to get the inverse of the matrix when you have only two equations, two unknowns, or three equations, three unknowns, because you can do this using your calculator. More than three unknowns, it will be difficult, and you, in this case, you need to get the inverse of the matrix, which you can do it with an Excel sheet or any uh, other way. So let's solve these two equations, and we'll get the unknown. From solving this one, we'll be able to get D1 and D2. You can find that D1 equals 4.505 divided by AE. You can keep it like this without putting or like putting the value of AE because later on we can, it will be removed when we get the forces in the members or, in the, or also the external reactions. D2 is minus 19.3 divided by AE. But what does it mean positive value here and the negative value here? D1, where is D1? The degree of freedom number one is going to the right direction. So if I have a positive value of D1, it means it will be the same direction as one. So it will be going to the right. However, for D2, is a negative value. Where is the two? The two is going upward here. And if this one is minus, so it means the D2 will be going downward, opposite to the direction of two. And this is logic, because under this load, you would expect that this point will go down. So you expect that the value of D2 will be a minus value. And if this one will go down, it will also will move a little bit to the right direction. So the X1 here, the D1, will be a positive, but with a smaller value. We have more displacement in the vertical and less displacement in the horizontal direction, which is also logic. Second step is to find the unknown forces. For unknown forces, we use the bottom part of the matrix, Q3, 4, 5, 6, equals K21 times unknown displacements, which are known now, okay, because we already got them, plus zeros because the second part will be that known displacement will be zero, so it will be eliminated. By expanding this one, we'll be able to find Q3, Q4, 5, and 6. And for example, if you want to get Q3, it will be AE. The AE will be eliminated with this AE because here the displacement was divided by AE. We can take it outside here. So this AE will be eliminated with the AE. So if we want to find Q3 equals minus 0 0.333 times 4.505, so this will give us a value of minus 1.5, and we are going to repeat for uh, Q4. For Q4, you can find zero and zero. So zero times anything, it will be zero. So expect that Q4 will be for sure zero. And we repeat the same for Q5 and Q6, and these are the values. Again, let's see which one is negative, which one is positive. Q3, it is negative. But before you decide it's going left, try it up or down, we have to see what is the Q3 on the drawing itself. Q3 here, this is the degree of freedom number three. It is going to the right by default. So if I have a negative value, I know that the reaction will be opposite to this three here and will be going to the left. Okay, so this one will be to the left. Of course, Q4 is zero. Then let's see Q5. Q5, again, it is a horizontal reaction and it is positive. So it means it's the same direction as Q5. So it will be going to the right. And then for Q6, it is a vertical reaction. And it is a positive, so it would be similar to the degree of freedom. Again, it would be going up. So once we got the external reaction, the last part of any problem is to find the forces in the members. Okay, determine the forces in the members. To do that, again, we have to use equation 14.23, which is this one. And as I told you, this will be given to you. And to apply this one, you need to know how much is lambda x and lambda y for each member? What is the AE? What is the length of each member? And also, what are the degrees of freedom at each member, at the near end, at, at the far end of each member? Let's do this 
Okay, so for member number one, which is this member here, okay, if you will go back and check lambda one, it was one, lambda two equals zero. You can check that from the previous lecture. And the length was three meters. Okay, this length was three meters. So I know lambda x and lambda y and L. And A, E, I will keep them constant. So I know this value, I know these values. How about D in X, D in Y, D F X and D F Y? D in X and D one in Y, these are the displacements at the near end in the X direction and in the Y direction. So here, what do we have at the near end here? We have, at the near end we have D one and D two. The X, D in X is D one. D in Y here is D two. So it is D one and D two. And at the far end, you have D3 and D4. We always start by the horizontal, then the vertical. So D1, D2, D3, and D4. Okay, let's put these values into this equation. And keep in mind that D1 and D2, they were unknown displacement, but we already got them at the first step of this example. We got D1 and D2. So let's put this value substitute into this equation. It will be like that. D1 A E over L, which is 3, times lambda X here, minus lambda X, so it will be minus 1. Then minus lambda Y, it will be 0. Then we have lambda X, it means 1, you put it here. And lambda Y, again, it will be 0. Then the displacement, and don't forget to put it divided by A E, because it was 4.505 divided by A E, minus 19 divided by A E. So don't forget to have the A E here, because the AE will be eliminated with this AE, and at the end, the force will be a value, not divided or multiplied by AE anymore. So once we calculate this, you will find that the Q1 will be minus 1.5 kilonewton. And again, minus in this case, it means a compression force. So you, the force in this member will be minus 1.4, 1.5 kilonewton. It means a compression. Let's repeat this again for member number two. Remember number two, if you go back to the previous uh, lecture and you will check about lambda x and lambda y for member number two, it was 0.6 and 0.8. Again, we are going to use the same equation here. The L was five meters because this is member number two. And the important thing here also, what is DNX, DNY, DFX, DFY? DNX is, again, because this member, the arrow is going from bottom to up, so this will be the near end. So the D in X and D in Y will be D1 and D2. Then at the far end, D in DFX, DFY will be D5 and D6. So D1, D2, D5, D6. Again, D1 and D2, we already have them here, D1 and D2. D5 and D6, if you still remember, they were zeros because no displacement at 5 and 6 because it's a pin support. Let's uh, put all of this into this equation. We'll have it like that. Again, solving this equation, the AE will be eliminated with AE, and at the end, we'll have a Q as a force, which is 2 kN, and post this positive, so it will be a tension force. So we have here a force of minus 1.5 kN, and a tension force here in the second member, member number 2, of 2.5 kN. Thank you for uh, watching, and this is the end of our lecture. Hope to see you. Uh, again in a previous lecture. Thank you.